Good day, everyone. Um, welcome back to another episode of the Lanfrica Talks. Um, today, we are super delighted to have Dr. Shruti with us. Dr. Shruti will be talking to us about unlocking text data for under-resourced languages. This is a very, very important talk because when we come to African languages and many low resource languages, text data exists, but it's locked away in printed books and a lot of places. And this talk is a very powerful talk that will show us how we could finally unlock most of this data. Dr. Shruti is a research scientist at Google. She recently graduated with a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, where her thesis focused on improving optical character recognition for endangered languages. Her broad research interests lie in improving language technologies for underrepresented languages and communities. She was awarded the Bloomberg Fellowship to support her PhD research and was named to the Forbes 30 under 30 list in science for her work on building NLP for endangered languages. We're very honored to have you, Dr. Shudi, and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Chris, uh, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Shruti, and it's really nice to be here uh, talking with all of you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, the research I did um, for my PhD thesis, uh, which was basically on trying to improve um, text extraction for under-resourced languages. Um, and uh, we'll basically be looking at um, a class of languages called endangered languages, but the methods are broadly applicable to, uh, to under-resourced languages in general. So let's get started. So as we all know, there has been considerable progress in recent years in expanding NLP technologies to languages beyond English. So this has been driven by several factors, including the creation of benchmark data sets uh, for many languages across uh, a diverse set of tasks. Another driving force has been the development of large scale language models that are pre-trained on many languages. And this progress in NLP research has also led to commercially available technologies like voice assistants, predictive keyboards, and so on, expanding their support to many more languages. And so, so let's look at pre-trained multilingual language models. They are trained on unlabeled text in each language, and this is often sourced from multilingual collections like Wikipedia or the Common Crawl. So um, this enables NLP, so it support, they usually support about 100 to 200 languages, and this enables NLP applications through cross-lingual transfer, like named entity recognition, question answering, machine translation, and so on. And this reduces the amount of annotated data required in each language. However, many of these 100 to 200 languages are very low resource and crossing will transfer may not actually be very straightforward. So there are multiple societal benefits to uh, having models that include a large number of languages. And this enables access to information and education from other languages. For example, if you have automatic translations of Wikipedia content or online shopping experiences in a customer's native language. And with current systems that support so many languages, everyday technologies can serve many more people. However, while these models support a large number of languages, there are over 7,000 living languages in the world. So they actually only include about 2% of the world's living languages. Most of these languages are underrepresented in state-of-the-art NLP research and development, and the 2.2 billion people that speak these languages are underserved by modern language technologies. So what's actually stopping us from expanding existing models to more languages? A major factor is the lack of unlabeled text. So if we look at Wikipedia, which is often one of the sources of unlabeled text in many languages, it has articles and therefore text in about 300 languages. However, they aren't evenly distributed. The top 15 to 20 languages have over a million articles each, but there's a steep drop as we move towards the long tail of languages on Wikipedia. And similar patterns hold for other large scale multilingual collections like the Common Crawl. So the lack of unlabeled data is a significant bottleneck both in annotating data sets 
where if we don't have existing text to annotate, we would have to recruit speakers of a language to create it. And this is challenging for lower resource languages. And the, multi the performance of multilingual models is limited by the amount of text available and technological advances are concentrated on languages that have easily available text. While we do have some amount of data in a few hundred languages in large, large multilingual collections like Wikipedia, there are thousands of languages without sufficient text for building NLP systems. So without text resources, how do we start moving towards improving the representation of these languages in modern NLP? It's actually not true that text data doesn't exist in many of these languages. However, it's locked away in formats that aren't machine readable and they can't be used to build NLP systems. There's a vast amount of text that's only available in the form of printed books, handwritten notes, and typewritten documents. So how many such documents exist? And are they in languages for which we actually need unlabeled text? So we looked at online archives that are publicly available, and we found that the Internet Archive has scanned books in at least 1,100 languages. And this is significantly larger than the current set of languages state-of-the-art multilingual models support. There are also tens of thousands of documents in linguistic archives. And these are resources collected or produced by documentary linguists over decades, and they contain text data in hundreds of very low resource languages. Given the large number of documents that are potential sources of text data, digitizing them into a machine readable format uh, has many advantages. For example, it would kickstart the development of NLP for these under resourced languages. We can use the extracted text to expand multilingual language models to more languages, as well as annotate data sets for downstream NLP tasks. There are other benefits to the digitization process as well particularly in terms of supporting communities that speak low resource languages. It will make their native text accessible and searchable to speakers and learners of the language. And this can aid researchers, educators, libraries, and so on that work on these languages. So how do we actually extract text from printed books? This is typically done. So if we have a scanned document, a scanned image of a printed book, like this from a book of folk tales in the endangered language Greco, we would typically use a process called optical character recognition, which recognizes each character in the image by looking at its shape, spacing, and other image characteristics, as well as its line level context to produce the text in a machine readable format. So OCR is a very well studied problem and state of the art methods have high accuracy on languages that have enough resources for training models. There are several off the shelf OCR tools that support many languages and scripts like Google Vision and Tesseract and they usually have pre-trained models for about 80 to 100 languages. However, there's little prior work on very low resource settings and to extract text from documents that don't already have existing text corpora we need techniques that work well with very, without much training data. So in this talk, I'm going to present some of my work that takes a step in this direction. I will briefly discuss the creation of an evaluation data set for low resource OCR and analyze the shortcomings of existing methods on these languages. I will also introduce neural models for improving OCR performance in in low resource settings using the technique of automatic post correction. And uh, finally, I will talk about a case study of how we apply our methods to language revitalization for the endangered language Quaquila, as well as present a web interface which uh, enables easier access to OCR technologies. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the evaluation data set that we created. It contains manually transcribed documents in four languages a book of epic poetry in Ainu, a language from Northern Japan, a book of folk tales in the Greek language of Southern Italy, um, three children's storybooks in the Yaka language of Nepal, and linguistic and cultural documentation in the Kwakula language of Canada, which was printed over a hundred years ago. These languages are orthographically diverse with Ainu using the Latin script, um, Greco using a combination of the Greek and Latin scripts, and Yaka using the Devanagari script. 
The document in Kwakula has an orthography that's unique to the language known as the Boas writing system. It's based on Latin script alphabets, but has several additional diacritics and digraphs for representing sounds that are unheard in other languages. So these uh, languages are very under-resourced in terms of modern NLP techniques. They don't have unlabeled text resources. They're not supported by current pre-trained language models, and they don't have easily accessible bilingual lexica. In our data set as well, we have fewer than a thousand transcribed lines per page, and this is significantly smaller than OCR data sets for most other languages. So as we discussed earlier, OCR is a very well-studied task, and there are a variety of methods and models, including supervised models that are based on large neural networks with state-of-the-art methods using tens of thousands of transcribed images for training. Unsupervised methods rely on a language model in the target language, and this requires a text corpus to produce. We also have large-scale off-the-shelf tools that have trained models for up to 100 languages, and these are usually based on supervised training. Although they aren't trained directly on the low-resource languages in our data set, um, they, do, uh, they do have models that support many languages and different scripts. So they can potentially act as a general character recognizer. Since training a supervised model from scratch is infeasible with our small data set, we focus on analyzing the performance of existing unsupervised and off-the-shelf systems in low-resource settings. So we measure OCR performance in terms of word error rate, which is the word edit distance between the prediction and the reference divided by the total number of words in the reference. And since we're looking at error rate, obviously having a lower error rate is better. So the first system we look at is the Google Vision OCR, which is an off-the-shelf tool that has models for many languages in about 29 scripts. The tool also has script-specific models, for example, a model for the Latin script or one for the Devanagari script. And these are pretty useful for our scenario because the tool doesn't directly support any of the languages in the evaluation data set, but some of the languages use the same script as several higher resource languages. We see that the system, looking okay, at the performance, we see that the system performs pretty well for languages that use a script that's already known to the model. So the model can actually do pretty well on zero shot cross-single transfer across languages that share scripts. In particular, we see that the word error rate is lower than 30% for Ainu, Greco, and Yaka with the Latin, Greek, and Devanagari scripts. However, in the case of Kwakula, where the script is not known to the model, the model performs quite a bit worse with a word error rate over 80%. Even, where the even for the languages where the model performs well, we did an in-depth analysis and found some common errors. So if we look at this example in the Greek code language, the output of the Google Vision system is shown here. One of the sources of error for the languages in, our, in the data set is that the OCR system isn't able to handle mixed scripts within a single line. Like in this case, where the Greek code word uses both the Greek and Latin alphabet. Additionally, lower resource languages that use uncommon diacritics to represent unique sounds the system hasn't seen these uncommon diacritics in the high resource languages it was trained on and is unable to always recognize them accurately. Next, we're going to look at the performance of an unsupervised OCR system called Ocular. Ocular requires a language model in the target language, but doesn't need any transcribed images for training. So we train Ocular's language model with the small number of transcriptions we have in the data set, and if we look at the performance, we do see that it is very reliant on the quality of the language model. The performance of Ainu and Yaka, which have relatively less data than the other two languages, are quite a bit worse than Google Vision. We do see that Ocular is considerably better than the off-the-shelf system for the Quakula data set, and that's because the language model is directly trained on Quakula text, and the character vocabulary contains all of the alphabet in the language's unique writing system. So the OCR methods we looked at do have reasonable performance in our data set, but compared to higher resource languages, there is considerable room for improvement. That said, 
these models do recognize the majority of the words correctly. So we use the OCR transcriptions from these existing systems as a starting point for further improvements rather than attempting to train the new model. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to present models that improve the results from existing OCR systems, relying on the technique of automatic OCR post-correction. So given an output from an existing OCR system on a scanned document from our data set, our previous analysis indicated that it should have some recognition errors. The process of post-correction takes this noisy first pass OCR transcript as input and fixes the recognition errors to produce a corrected transcription. Previous work has used post-correction to counteract the lack of training data for new fonts, layouts, and domains without having to retrain the OCR system for each new distribution. In this talk, we'll do something similar and develop post-correction methods for languages without enough data to train a high-performance OCR system. The standard setup of post-correction is a text-based sequence-to-sequence task, and it doesn't use visual information. The first pass OCR is the input text, and the corrected transcription is the output text. So post-correction is well-studied in the high-resource setting, particularly for English, and many recent state-of-the-art methods use a character-level encoder-decoder model where characters in the first pass OCR are converted to embeddings and then passed through an LSTM encoder. An attention mechanism with a decoder LSTM generates the corrected transcription at the character level. Existing work has typically re relied on supervised training with lots of parallel first pass OCR transcriptions and a corresponding corrected text. Since our manually annotated data set is significantly smaller, we're going to try to build on previous models and adapt them to learning in low resource settings. So with the minimal annotated data we have, it is challenging for the network to learn a good distribution over the target characters. To make it easier for the model to learn from small amounts of data, we add structural biases into the model, and these are based on the characteristics of the post-correction task. The first of these is a diagonal attention loss. So post-correction is approximately a monotonic sequence to sequence task and reordering is rare. So with this in mind, if we take a matrix of the attention vectors from all the time steps, we expect the weights to be closer, to be higher closer to the diagonal. So we add the off diagonal elements to the training loss at each time step, which encourages lower weights at those elements. We also know that the first pass OCR recognizes the majority of characters correctly. So we add a copy mechanism to allow the model to copy a character from the input text. The decoder LSTM generates a probability distribution for the next character at each time step, while the copy mechanism samples a character from the attention vector. We have a generation probability that interpolates between the decoder and the copy mechanism. We also have a coverage mechanism that keeps track of the attention weights from previous time steps. And the coverage vector is a sum of attention vectors from previous time steps and is used as extra input in future time steps to discourage the model from attending to the same characters repeatedly. So these biases can likely be learned by the model with enough data, but adding them explicitly in the low resource setting is a simple way to ease learning. The next thing we do is leverage additional information from the source document. More specifically, many documents that contain text in, a, in an endangered language also contain a translation of the text. For example, translations are found in interlinear glosses, in dictionaries, in linguistic documentation, as well as language learning material. And this is also observed in the documents in our data set. The book containing Ainu poetry also contains its translation in Japanese. Similarly, the Greco book has Italian translations and the Yaka texts have translations in Nepali and in English. We can apply an off-the-shelf OCR tool to get transcriptions from the scanned images of the translations. Since these are typically in high resource languages, we expect the OCR to generally be of high quality. 
In our model, we have a character level encoder for the low resource language. So for example, to encode the first pass OCR in Greco. We add another encoder to the model that processes the OCR transcription of the translation. To use information from the two sources, we concatenate the context vectors from both attention mechanisms to be used in the decoding process. The multi-source mechanism essentially conditions the decoder's generation process on both the low resource first pass OCR, as well as the text translation. We train the model in a supervised way with the small amount of annotated data we have in the data set. So we first look at the performance of the baseline OCR post-correction system and how, and how it performs in the languages in our data set as compared to the first pass system. So the baseline system is an encoder decoder model, which has been used by um, um, much of the previous work in OCR post-correction and has all typically been used for higher resource settings. So we do tenfold cross-validation because our uh, data set is pretty small and it's at the performance average of five random seeds. So for each language, we choose the best performing first pass system, and which is Google Vision for Aino, Greco, and Yaka, and Ocular for Quakula. We see the performance of the baseline method here. So this is, as I said, an encoder-decoder model without any of our proposed adaptations. The model improves the word error rate a little bit for Greco, but actually worsens performance for the other languages. And this indicates that the limited data is not enough for the model to learn a good distribution. When we include the proposed adaptations to the model, the word error rate reduces for all the languages in our data set by up to 52% over the first pass OCR. We also did an ablation study to see which of our adaptations were most useful. We found that all the adaptations were useful in improving performance, but including the copy mechanism impacts performance the most. So the current post correction model is trained with supervised learning on a small number of manually transcribed pages. We did see a decrease in word error rate over the first pass OCR, but any further improvements will require more manual annotation over the small number of pages we already have. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to discuss how we can improve performance without any additional annotation. So while we have a small number of transcribed pages, we also have a large number of unannotated raw images that need to be digitized. In our data set, the documents contain hundreds of pages, but only a small subset is manually transcribed. So what, what we're gonna do is we're going to use semi-supervised learning to efficiently use these unlabeled images to improve transcription accuracy. These unlabeled images are obtained much more easily than manual annotations. So first we incorporate the very simple semi-supervised learning technique of self-training into the post-correction model that I just described. So we can get a first pass OCR using an existing OCR system on the hundreds of unlabeled images we have, apply a trained post-correction model like our previous best supervised model and obtain predictions on these images. We can then use the predictions as pseudo-training data to retrain the model. And this process is repeated iteratively to get better predictions. Although self-training is a simple approach to improve performance without manual annotation, incorrect predictions in the pseudo-training data may introduce noise back into the model. And this can potentially reinforce errors in the next iteration of self-training. So in our initial experiments, we analyzed the self-training predictions to figure out if we could bias post-correction towards ignoring the noise and generating correct words. In the unlabeled images we're applying self-training on, the same word may be present several times in different contexts, like this example from our Quakula dataset. The model may make different predictions for different instances of the word, both correct and incorrect predictions. For example, here, the model was uh, the model predicted the word correctly seven times and incorrectly nine times. In our empirical observations, we saw that incorrect predictions of the word of a specific word are typically incorrect in different ways, 
since the word appears in different contexts across pages and documents. So what that means is different subsets of characters in the word are incorrectly predicted. This leads to the noise from self-training being inconsistent at the word level, which in turn leads to the correct form of the word being more frequent than any of the incorrect forms, even if the word is incorrectly predicted more times. So to counteract the noise introduced by self-training, we develop a technique to use this frequency-based information while doing post-correction to reinforce the correct forms of the words during decoding. So during the decoding process, the probability of the next character currently depends on the decoder LSTM. Based on previous observations um, uh, from, uh, on, on the inconsistent noise, we also want to include a frequency-based probability in the model during decoding. So how do we get these probabilities that are based on word frequency. A simple method that explicitly models for word frequency is a count-based language model. So given the predictions from self-training, we train a word-level unigram model on the counts of the word forms. And this gives us frequency-based probabilities of each word, essentially forming a noisy weighted lexicon from the predictions. And we also use smoothing to reserve some probability mass for words that are not seen in the predictions. A significant advantage of using this type of model is that it's very easy to update as the predictions iteratively improve with self-training. We now have word frequency probabilities from the Unigram language model, which acts as a weighted lexicon. This information can be combined with the neural decoder for post-correction, we call this process lexically aware decoding. However, there is still one step missing. These probabilities that we get from the Unigram language model are at the word level, but decoding for post-correction is at the character level. How do we get character level probabilities from the word frequency language model? To do this, we represent the word frequency language model using a weighted finite state automaton or WFSA. A WFSA is a set of states with transitions between them, and each transition accepts a character and has a score associated with it. So let's look at this simple language model, which has two words, dog and door, and we'll use this to demonstrate the construction of the WFSA representation. It has a start state from which we add transitions to consume each character in the word in sequence. So if we're looking at the word dog, we add transitions to consume D-O-G in sequence. The score to enter that path of states is the same probability from the count-based language model for that word, and subsequent transitions are assigned a probability of one. So the total cost for the path to process the word dog at the character level is the same as the probability of dog from the word level language model. And this is essentially the behavior we want where we convert the word probabilities to a character level representation. So we can do the same thing for all the other words in the count-based language model. If you look at the word door, we add transitions in a similar way. So if we have the output D-O-O-R and the model has processed it going through the states, we're in the last state on that path. The output in the post-correction task are lines or sentences, and these contain more than one word. But in its current form, the WFSA can only accept a single word and not the remaining characters in the output. For example, if we have a space character and the alphabet of the first alphabet of the next word. So to allow this, we add transitions back to the start state from the end of each word. And these accept word boundary symbols like spaces and punctuation. So once the model is back in the start state, it can begin accepting characters from the next word. So since we're in a low resource setting, um, the count-based language model likely isn't high coverage. So we also need to be able to score words that are unknown to the language model. To do this, we add an unknown word state to the WFSA with a transition that doesn't consume any symbols to enter it. So this is known as an epsilon transition. And the penalty to generate an unknown word is the smooth unknown word probability from the count-based language model. 
So the unknown word state can accept any sequence of characters. And to score these, we use a character n-gram language model that's also learned on the predictions from the self-training process. We apply standard algorithms for determinization and minimization on the WFSA states. And this leads to an efficient and compact representation of the cont-based language model. So coming back to our lexically aware decoding formulation, we have the next character probability, which is determined by the decoder LSTM, as well as a frequency-based probability. We get the frequency-based probability by simply using the transition score from the current WFSA state for that character. So the WFSA representation essentially gives us character level scores that are based on word frequency. In order to combine the information, we use simple linear interpolation weighted by a tunable hyperparameter. So using the WFSA representation gives us a really simple and effective way to do joint inference with a character level neural decoder and a word level count based language model. So overall, our semi-supervised model uses labeled data to train a baseline post-correction method and for fine-tuning, while using the unlabeled data for self-training and lexically aware decoding. So the first thing we do is we look at whether using self-training as a semi-supervised learning method improves performance over the supervised model I presented earlier. So um, we're looking at word error rate again. We have the word error rate of the first pass OCR, which is Google Vision and Ocular, as well as the word error rate of the supervised model, which we saw improves performance um, for all the languages in our data set. When we add self-training, we do see that the, it actually performs pretty well for Greco, Yaka, and Quacola, reducing the word error rate for these languages. But self-training actually makes the performance a little bit worse for INO. So this indicates that the noise introduced by self-training can sometimes overpower its general utility. So when we combine self-training with lexically aware decoding, we get significant reduction in word error rate over the supervised model for all the languages in our data set. And if we especially look at INO, where self-training independently resulted in worse performance, Adding lexically aware decoding actually reduces the word error rate and improves it by 15%. So if we look at the overall picture, with respect to the first pass OCR, the supervised model improves performance in all cases. When we add the proposed semi-supervised learning method, the word error rate is reduced by up to 59% over existing OCR systems. We also look at character error rate, which can be a useful measure because it indicates what fraction of characters in the output a human transcriber would have to correct in order to have error-free text. Compared to existing OCR systems, our best method improves character error rate significantly in all languages with error reductions between 33 and 58%. So finally, I just wanted to look at um, because we use the best first pass OCR system as a starting point, uh, where we use Google Vision for some languages and Ocular for other languages, um, it may not actually be the case that for under-resourced languages, the first pass OCR is that accurate. We could be starting at a much worse point. So to evaluate the reliance of our post-correction method on the first pass, we look at the Quacola dataset and two first pass systems. So the first, one, the first one we look at is an off-the-shelf tool, Google Vision, and this has a high error rate because the script is not known to the tool. So as you can see in the example here, Quacola uses a combination of the Latin alphabet as well as many unusual diacritics and digraphs. We also use Ocular, which has a language model trained on a small amount of Quacola language data and is a much more accurate first-pass OCR. We apply a post-correction method to the OCR transcripts from both these systems, and we see that we're actually able to reduce the word error rate for both systems by a large amount, even when the first pass OCR is not very accurate to begin with. So this shows it can be used to improve results from a wide range of existing OCR systems. The first pass OCR from the Google Vision tool is shown on this randomly selected image here, and the incorrect words are highlighted. When we apply post-correction as uh, with the models I proposed today, 
um, we're able to correct over 75% of the incorrect words. So you can see that the corrected words uh, are highlighted in blue and most of the words are corrected by our system. So using automatic post correction can make manual search and proofreading much easier for downstream users. So to summarize what we've talked about so far, thousands of languages don't have easily accessible text to build NLP models and data sets because there are only a few hundred languages in large scale multilingual collections. However, text data does exist in many of these languages, but it's locked away in formats that aren't machine readable like printed books and documents. In this talk, I presented uh, methods to improve the results of OCR systems in extracting text from documents in very low resource languages. The supervised multi-source model reduced word error rate by up to 52%, and we got further improvements from lexically aware semi-supervised learning uh, with the semi-supervised learning technique. So I'd also like to talk about the practical impact and applications that the models we discussed today are having. Our data set contains documents in four very low resource languages, Ainu, Greco, Quakola, and Yaka. Uh, previously, there was no machine readable text in these languages, but with our post-correction methods, there are now hundreds of pages of machine readable text in each of these languages. As, as a specific case study of the impact, I wanted to talk about how our models have been applied to Quakula revitalization, uh, Quakula language revitalization programs. So Quakula is an endangered language that's spoken on the Western coast of Canada. And um, uh, I think that there are about 150 native speakers of the language. So it's a very, very, uh, very, very endangered language. Um, and there are, there are active programs that are trying to preserve and revitalize the Kwakula language um, and uh, introduce it back into the community. So um, written documentation of the language extends back over 120 years. And the communities are actively engaged in language research and teaching in order to preserve and revitalize the language. So the BOAS texts, which are 14 volumes of Kwakola documentation um, about the language and the community that speaks it, was produced by Franz Boas and George Hunt over 100 years ago. So these encompass a grammar of the language, word lists, stories, recipes, and many much more information about the community. So these texts have tremendous cultural and linguistic value, but they were minimally accessible to researchers because they're still trapped in image files, so scanned images of the documents, which are not machine readable. So if a researcher had to locate information, they would have to look through hundreds and thousands of images in order to find it. And the Boas writing system is also an older orthography for Quakola that's hard to read. So um, researchers would often retype the entire document in order to be able to share it with a broader audience. So uh, if we were able to improve OCR, we could improve access to these documents, tag them, index them, as well as automatically transliterate them to community preferred orthographies. So what we do is we unlock these resources using our OCR post-correction model for Quakola, converting hundreds of scanned images from these documents into machine readable text. So as we saw with our quantitative results, the character and word error rates uh, improve over existing OCR systems when we use our post-correction model. But is the automatically extracted text actually useful downstream? To evaluate this, we do a user study on manual transcription of Quakola documents. So our goal is actually to produce accurate transcriptions that Quakola speakers and researchers can use. Traditionally, accurate transcriptions of the Boas Hunt publications would be produced by a human transcriber. So they would look at the scanned image and retype the text present in it. And of course, this is very time consuming and requires a lot of manual effort. So we conduct a user study to analyze whether using OCR and OCR post-correction before the manual transcription process is useful in reducing the time that is spent by a human annotator in producing an accurate transcription. So in the user study, we try to answer two questions. 
The first is, does using OCR make manual transcription faster? And the second is, with our post-correction models, do we have any additional benefit over existing OCR systems, specifically for um, the, the study that we're uh, performing, where we're trying to see if we're able to help human transcribers in making their, uh, making their efforts less time consuming. So we employed nine participants for a study, all of whom had some transcription experience. An academic linguist working on Kwakwala, a Kwakwala heritage language learner, um, as well as uh, seven participants who had no familiarity with Kwakwala, uh, three computer science graduate students, as well as four participants from Upwork, which is a marketplace for freelance professionals. For our transcription interface, we built it using Label Studio, an open source data annotation software for transcription tasks. So as you can see, for the, uh, for the task, the image is displayed, and alongside there's a text box for the user to enter the transcription. So many characters and diacritics in the Hunt Boas orthography are not present on a standard computer keyboard. So we also design a keyboard for uh, the users to efficiently transcribe the documents. We had three different setups for the task. So the first is a bit the baseline setup, which um, basically does not include the use of any OCR system. And this is the traditional way uh, that people have used to transcribe the BOAS documents. We also use an existing OCR system. Um, in this case, we use Ocular on the image for each task prior to manual annotation. And the third setup is a setup where we use our post-correction model um, prior to manual annotation, and the task is to correct any remaining errors. So essentially what it would look like is for the baseline system, there would be a blank text box near next to the image, and the user would have to type out the text um, while looking at the image. If we used an OCR system or post-correction before the task, the text box would be pre-filled with the output from the, the system. And the task is for the human transcriber to correct any remaining errors. So that is essentially how the task is designed. So we computed how long it took to complete each task. So we had nine users and they transcribed nine pages each. So we have 81 measurements of transcription speed. We can't use the time values directly because transcription time is not independent of different sources of variability. So in order to draw a statistically significant conclusion, we use a mixed effects, a linear mixed effects model to describe the relationship between the transcription time and the factors that contribute to variance, which are a combination of different random effects and fixed effects, including the page ID, the participant ID, and the task setup. So by using the mixed effects model, we're able to model the transcription time by factoring, factoring in all of these effects that can add sources of random sources of variable that are sources of variability and can and can affect the, the significance of our conclusions. So the first thing we look at is does using any form of OCR make transcription faster? And here uh, we're comparing the baseline to using any form of OCR. So essentially either ocular or post-correction. The baseline system, um, which does not, uh, we're measuring uh, transcription time in minutes, and these are estimations from the linear mixed effects model for the baseline and the OCR, uh, and when we use OCR. So with the baseline, it does not use any OCR and the user uh, types from scratch, we see that the estimated time per page is around 61 minutes from the linear mixed effects model. The estimated time for when we use some form of OCR system is actually reduced by 50% over the baseline. So this indicates that um, using any form of OCR can significantly reduce the manual effort that's needed by a human transcriber to produce an accurate transcription. So in the previous slide, I compared the baseline with any form of OCR, so either ocular or post-correction. But since we are looking at post-correction specifically in this talk, I'm also going to compare whether uh, post-correction can improve even further over using an existing OCR like ocular. So again, we're going to look at the estimated time in minutes from the linear mixed effects model. 
And the existing OCR system we use here is Ocular, and the estimated time is about 31 minutes per page. When we use our proposed post-correction technique, we see that the, uh, the estimated time is actually reduced by almost seven minutes, um, and it is statistically significant. So this means that investing in post-correction can actually lead to uh, lead to gains in uh, downstream manual transcription as well, because we can see here that it reduces the time by 21%. So um, just to give you an overall picture of what having good post-correction models for your language can do is I'm going to describe the tools and resources that we created for the Coaquila language. So um, the documents that we looked at have both English text and Coaquila text, which are translations of each other. And we were able to extract English and Coaquila text from over 1500 pages. And note that this is, for a language that had effectively zero machine readable text to start with. And now we have over 1500 pages of machine readable text. Um, the text is accessible by a much larger audience now that it's machine readable. We built a full OCR pipeline for the Hunt Boas orthography that can be applied to other books authored by Hunt and Boas. And we also created a virtual keyboard for this orthography that has been employed by multiple other groups outside this project, including community-based teachers and learners of Quaquila, as well as li li librarians, archivists, and managers of repositories where these materials are being held. So as you can see with the models, we have been able to demonstrate significant practical impact in supporting community-based efforts for Quaquila language revitalization. The machine readable text that we've generated is now being used to, uh, to train downstream language models, which are going to be used for automatic speech recognition and other tasks that the community is interested in. So finally, I want to talk about um, how using OCR tools, including the tools that I described in today's talk, requires some amount of technical proficiency. So even popular tools like Google Vision and Tesseract require some familiarity with code packages, installing dependencies, and so on to apply the available off-the-shelf software. And these dependencies are different for each tool. So as we showed, having highly accurate OCR transcriptions can be very beneficial to communities that speak endangered languages. And if our software is only available as a command line script or a code module, it is, it's limited in accessibility to people who may not have the same technical skills. So in order to make the software more user friendly, we designed a web interface that supports no code application of state-of-the-art OCR and post-correction models. So the front end of the website looks like this. So one function we support is inference with off-the-shelf OCR, like Google Vision and Tesseract. And users can obtain transcriptions from scanned images by choosing the system. So you can see in the image, you can choose Google Vision and then also choose the images you want to apply and then download the OCR outputs. So you can experiment with different off-the-shelf systems, which allows users to compare and contrast results and decide which would work best for their target documents. And all of this is within a single interface. So you don't have to worry about downloading different software. It's all done in one interface. Additionally, uh, we have post-correction, um, which is the models that I talked about today, um, where you can essentially upload uh, training data as well as unlabeled data, train a new model, and apply a trained model file to predict on new documents as well. So the interface is adaptable to different workflows based on the user's needs. We are looking for testers for the interface because it's just a prototype right now. So if you're interested and have documents um, that you'd like to apply our models on, please email me. Um, finally, overall, uh, this the work that I presented today, we've released publicly released an evaluation data set and trained models for four endangered languages, as well as software to train post-correction models on new languages and data sets. And it's actually been used on a bunch of other languages apart from the four languages I talked about today by independent researchers from all over the world. So um, I have had some people telling me about how useful the software was. So Ben Foley told us about how it was completely transformative for, uh, for the documents that um, Ben was working on. Um, Chad found the system to be enormously useful. 
And for Tibetan, um, it made documents a lot easier to proofread. Um, so there are lots of exciting research directions stemming from the work I talked about today. Um, so some of these include uh, scaling up to extract text for many more languages. We've started with a small number of languages, um, but it's important to be able to try to digitize all of the documents available in, in, in online archives. So this could be done potentially through improving post-correction through active learning, which would reduce the reliance on manual transcription as well as improving low resource handwriting text recognition because because a lot of these documents are handwritten and not typed like the documents we looked at in today's talk. Extracting text though is just the beginning. When we have text in under resource languages, we have a number of applications that become possible. So the documents become accessible and searchable on web and mobile interfaces, which is very important for communities that speak these languages. We can annotate the text for downstream NLP tasks, as well as extend pre-trained multilingual language models to many more languages through self-supervised learning. These models can be used uh, after we have uh, trained them on text extracted from scanned documents for a variety of NLP tasks, um, particularly through cross-lingual transfer, and to build NLP systems that are inclusive of many more languages. We've already started working on some of these systems with a community that speaks Quaculab, as I said before. So coming back to the main topic of my talk today, we discussed models and applications for OCR post-correction in very low resource settings. I'm gonna leave the key take takeaways from my talk on this slide for uh, the question answer period. Um, if you'd like to try out our software, get the data, you can um, just scan this QR code and it should open the website where it's available. And if you want to try out the web interface for OCR and post-correction, please feel free to send me an email. Um, of course, you can also email me about anything else related to this talk. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Shirti. It was super amazing um, learning about the work you've done. You've really unlocked text data for many of these low resource languages. I know about I know a couple of people who'll be really fascinated and really this will really help them. So I would definitely, um, we will be reaching out to you. Let me just put it like that. So we're reaching okay. out to you to, to try the um, the software. Thank you so okay, much for the work you've good. done. Thank you so much thank for the talk. So we're much. very honored to have yeah, you. Really, really happy to be here. Um, yeah, if uh, anyone has anything else to ask, feel free to email me anytime.